Yeah. All right, so Job 28 there, one of my favorite chapters. I, this is a chapter that I, I enjoy reading uh, quite a bit. Sometimes, you know, when I, I just want to read a great chapter in the Bible, other than just what I'm reading in my own devotion, sometimes I'll just turn over to Job 28. It's always been one of my favorites. I think part of the reason that is, you know, it's a, it's a real, if I can't say, a gem of a chapter here in, in Job 28. Forgive the pun, but in Job, you know, there's a lot of real, some heavy reading when we start to listen to some of these other guys talk, these other, these, uh, un, these, uh, these miserable counselors that come to Job in his, in his misery. And Job 28, uh, I think, is just a great reminder of, of the greatness of God and, and, and the value of wisdom. And I really just want to just go through this chapter real quick and, and point some things out. And verses 1 through 11 here in Job 8, 28 show us that, that God's ability to see things that are hidden from physical view. I know we touched on that last week a little bit when we talked about how there's nothing hidden from his eyes, that, that all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But also, you know, it's showing here again that same concept in Hebrews chapter, or excuse me, in, in uh, Job 28, where it shows us in, in verses 1 through 11 that God can see the things that are hidden from our eyes. He can see the things that are way down deep in the earth. That's what he's specifically talking about. He's talking in those verses 1 through 11 about the things that are buried deep beneath the earth. It says there in 28 uh, verse 3, it says, He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection. And of course, in the Bible, the word perfection means completeness or wholeness or something that is in its entirety. So God is able to see everything, is what it's showing here. He searcheth out all perfection. He searcheth out everything that there is, that He can see all of it. And not only that, but specifically here in, in Job 28, He's showing us that God sees the elements that are hidden in the earth. If you look there at verse 3, it says that he seeth the stones of darkness. I believe what he's referring to there, you know, are the, are the precious things that are, that are the stones that are hidden deep down in the earth. The stones of darkness. That says in verse 1, surely there is a vein for silver. And that's what we see miners going for. They look for that vein of silver, a vein running through the rocks and cracks of the earth. And he says there is a place for gold. There's also a place deep down in the earth where, where, where people can find gold. That's where they find it. It says in verse 2, iron is taken out of the earth and brass is molten out of the stone. Verse 4, the flood breaketh out from the inhabitant, the waters forgotten of the foot, they are drawn up, they are gone away from men. Verse 5, for the earth, as for the earth that cometh, out of it cometh bread and under it is turned up as it were fire. So God's saying he sees all these precious things. He sees the silver, he sees the gold, he sees the iron, all these things that are deep down in the earth. And not only that, but he says that he sees that under the earth it is turned up as it were fire. And even science will tell us today, and we can observe you know, from the volcanoes and things, that the, the, the magma and the lava that comes up from the earth, from deep down within the earth, and it comes out through the volcanoes. So we, under, we see that deep down in the earth there it literally is a place of fire. It just shows here... Now, a book of Job is, is already, when it was written, there was already an understanding that God's word was already scientifically correct, that it was ahead of science, and understanding that under the earth it were as, as it were fire. And the Bible alludes to that in other places as well. That's not really the focus of the sermon, but it would be an interesting study to do. It goes on in verse 6, it, it, verse six, it says, The stones of it were as the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. Now it's real interesting there. You know, he talks about sapphires and, and all those precious stones that are deep down there, but it says specifically it hath dust of gold. And it's real interesting that today in, in our modern mining, when, when men are going down, they're going down not just for, you know, we get the idea of the miners being you know, the guys, you know, in the gold rushes of, in California and things like that, where they would go out and you see the old movies where they, they find gold in the, in the mountains and it's always, you know, the, the, the rock breaks away and it's just this, you know, shining sheer face of, of solid gold. And that very well be the case. I, I don't know. That's probably a possibility. But when you get deep down in the earth like that, they're not mining for this, this sheer face of gold. They're looking for literally microscopic traces of gold. They're looking for gold that cannot even be seen with the naked human eye. You can't even see it. If you were to find it, it would just look like a pile of rock to you. But, it, but on a microscopic level, there is gold in that. That's why it says there is dust of gold. And that's what these men mine for. And they mine for them, they bring it to the surface, and they go, it goes through this entire process, and they collect all those tiny pieces of gold that we can't see and create and, and, and retrieve billions of dollars of worth of gold out of it. And what, the verse, what Job 28 here is showing us is that the things that are difficult for man to find and, and recover are things that are easily seen and attained by God. Man searches for these things. Man looks for the dust of gold. Man looks for the silver and the sapphires and all these precious stones deep down on the earth. And he tries to find it. And, and, and there's entire industries that are built around mining things out of the earth. 
And the Bible said, and the Bible showing us here that God knows where all those things are. He's the one who put them there. And then we see man, you know, endeavoring to retrieve those things from the earth, from, from you know, going to great lengths to and spending billions and, and just these, this giant industry, employing thousands of people, taking vast tracts of land on the earth and, and just tearing it all up in, in an effort to retrieve this, these precious substances. And the Bible shows us that God can retrieve those things very quickly. Verse 9, it says, He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountains by the roots. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks. His eye seeth every precious thing, precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing. The thing that is hidden bringeth he forth to light. So God, if he, wanted, if he wanted, could easily just rend the earth. He could turn the mountains over. And he could see all these precious things. God could find them very, very easily. And man puts a lot of, of course, we value those things. Man puts a lot of value in, in the gold and, and things like that. And silver and all these precious stones, the stones of darkness. Those are the things that man seeks after. And God is showing us here that, that these things are hidden. And these things are difficult for man to find and, and man to, to, to get, but he can easily get them. And that's why God puts the premium elsewhere. The point of this chapter is not just to show us what a great miner God is, but it's to show us that God puts the premium, God puts the true value of some, somewhere else. What God values, what God holds in high esteem, is not the precious things. If you look there in verse 12, it says this, But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? So that's the question that's asked in verse 12 after showing us that God can see all these things. That God can see all these precious stones, all these things of great value that man would desire to have. And God says, but where is wisdom? But where can you go to find wisdom? You can dig down in the earth and you can find all these precious stones, but where can you find wisdom? Because that's what the true value is. Because the Bible is showing us here that wisdom and understanding cannot be mined like a precious metal. It's not something that we can just, if it would be that easy, if only it were that easy, that we could become wise by just digging a hole in the earth and finding a pile of wisdom and making it our own. But that Bible is showing us here that's just not the case. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 5, that counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So having counsel, having wisdom, is something that's within a man. It's something that God gets from God, and it's something that if we find in another, it's something that has to be drawn out. That's a place where we can find wisdom, is in another man who is studying the Word of God, a man who has a walk with God, a man who has experience in, 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 in living for God. We can draw the wisdom out of that man. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So that's a very precious thing as well. A woman who has virtue, a woman who has wisdom and knowledge and understanding, a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. The Bible says that her price is far above rubies. You see, God this morning is not putting the emphasis and the value on carnal and earthly things, things that we would hold in high esteem, things that are, are valued for, for, for high amounts of money. God is not putting the, the, the premium on precious jewels and silver and gold. No, He's putting the premium this morning on wisdom, on knowledge, on understanding. You see, that which is difficult is, is valuable. Why is it that gold and silver and, and all these things are so valuable? It's because they're hard to find. I mean, there's no value in a, in a plain rock. There's no value in dirt. It's everywhere. There's no value really in air because we just breathe it. We can't, man can't capture those things and, and hold them captive and sell them to another. But he can do that with the precious things. Man can do that with gold. Man can do that with silver. You see, that which is difficult to find is valuable. And that's what makes wisdom so valuable. Because true wisdom and understanding is hard to find. There's a saying, you know, that fools are a dime a dozen. And that's very true. You know, any of us that have gone on YouTube know that to be true. You know, there's a lot of fools out there today that can just, you know, spout off and express themselves and, and, and have people listen to what they have to say. And they're fools. And they're a dime a dozen. But the man that has true understanding, the man that has real wisdom, the man that has the knowledge of God, that's a value. That is a man who has something truly valuable, and he's rare. You see, man can readily mine precious metals. It'd be easiest for, for us to go do that. And you know, and as, as I've said, we you know it, we could go and we could talk about all the huge mines and the pits that are dug and all the, the just the amazing facts, just the the, the, the numbers that they that they do, the, the amount of land they take up, the, the tons and tons of earth that are moved, and and and, and man you know can can do that stuff. You know, he makes these huge, you know, that just gigantic pieces of machinery that make it very easy for man to go and mine. And man would look at that. Man would look at these crushers and these, these, these trucks, I mean, that are two stories tall, just huge, 
tires as big as, you know, taller than the ceiling here this morning. Just giant trucks and huge excavators that can, you know, fit entire marching bands inside of the bucket. I mean, this, the, I used to work with heavy equipment, so I get kind of excited about this stuff. But I'm, ta I'm saying, we, man would look at that, he would look at all this impressive machinery that man has built. He would look at man's ability to, to, to dig down hundreds, yeah, even a thousand or plus more feet down into the earth from the surface. And we say, wow, that's really something. And man makes the mistake of, of, of thinking ingenuity and inventiveness is wisdom. Man would look at that and say, well, man must be very wise. But that's not the case. And if we need any proof of that, just look at the world around us. Look at the foolishness that we see going around in the world. That people can't even figure out, you know, which bathroom to go in more, or what clothes to put on, or, or what it means to be a man, or what it means to be a woman, or how to raise their children. All these things that man has understood for centuries, it seems like today, have just gone by the wayside, and they just don't even understand even the most simple and basic things from the Word of God. Because man has become more and more foolish, despite the fact that he's been able to achieve greater and greater technological advances. You see, man mistakes ingenuity for wisdom. But the Bible asks a question in verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? A man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the, in the land of the living. It says, where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? You see, man doesn't even know where to begin to look for wisdom today. He doesn't even know where to begin. It's not that wisdom is, is, is hidden away. It's very easy to find, as we'll see here it, it shortly. But man doesn't even know where to begin to look. That's what makes it so rare. Because man has lost wisdom. He doesn't know where to look. Where shall wisdom be found? The deaf saith it is not in me, and the sea saith it is not with me. Look at verse 20. Whence then cometh the wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Man doesn't understand the true value of wisdom. Not only can man not know where to look for it, not as man only not understand where to find wisdom, but he doesn't even understand the true value of wisdom, and that's why he can't find it. Because he doesn't understand the value of it. If man understood the value of wisdom, then he would look for it. But man doesn't understand the value of wisdom. Therefore, he does not look for it. Therefore, he does not find it, and that is why wisdom today is so rare. That's why wisdom is more valuable than gold or silver or precious stones. Look at verse 15. It says, It cannot be gotten for gold. Verse 16, It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir. Go, verse 17, The gold and the crystal cannot equal it. No mention shall be made of coral. Verse 17. Verse 19, The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it. Neither shall be valued with pure gold. You see, wisdom isn't something you can go, you put a price on. It's that rare. That even the most precious things in the world, even the most precious metals that we can find in the world today, even the most rare stones that a man can dig at and mine out of the earth and discover, those things cannot even begin to value, be compared to the value of wisdom. And this would explain all the rich fools we see in the world today. Wouldn't it? And isn't that what the Bible teaches in 1 Timothy verse 6? It says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and into a snare and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. So we see that they that will be rich, those that would desire great gain, those that would desire to have uh, abundance of wealth, they're the ones that fall into what kind of lusts? Foolish lusts. They're the ones that go after the most foolish things. You know, a great example of this, I, I saw last night Pastor Anderson released that documentary, um, you know, Japan, Kamikaze Nation. And it showed you how Japan, a country that experienced great prosperity, they, they, they were one of the leading manufacturers in the world. They produced all these you know, great vehicles and motors and engines and, 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 and all these uh, you know, microprocessors, all these technologically advanced things. And they, had, they were one of the great exporters of the world, Japan. And they experienced great wealth. But you look at them today, and that country is falling apart from within. The Bible says that the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. That's exactly what we see happening in a nation like Japan, and yea, even to some degree in the nation of America. Our prosperity, our wealth, our abundance of the things that we uh, have, those things are going to be the things that destroy us if we take them for granted and don't understand that the, all the good things, every perfect thing cometh down from the, the Father of lights, that every good thing we receive is from God. The Bible says they that will be rich fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You see, the rich despise wisdom. Why? 
Why is it that the rich fall into foolish lust? Why is it that the rich despise wisdom? Because they, they can't purchase it. It's the one thing that they can't go out and buy. The Bible says that money answereth all things. The Bible says that, uh, but the Bible is showing us that, that they cannot just go out and buy wisdom. That's why they despise it. They can go out and they can buy any number of things. They can have whatever the, whatever the world has to offer. As the saying goes, everything's for sale, right? That's what they say. Everything is for sale. Just take them in back and sit back there, please. It's getting distracting. The Bible says that, uh, that, that they fall into foolish and hurtful lusts because they can't purchase wisdom. That's why they're fools. You see, the rich despise God because He is the source of wisdom. They can't go to God and buy wisdom. That's why they despise God. The Bible says in James 2, Ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you? And draw you before the judgment seat? Do they not they blaspheme that worthy day by which ye are called? And isn't the most rich, the most wealthiest people in the world, aren't they the ones that we see despising and blaspheming God? We think of people like George Soros, you know, multi-millionaire. A guy that just blasphemes God, hates the things of God, hates, hates anything that, that would resemble the teaching of the Word of God. Hates it. Other, and we could go on and on. You know, Bill Gates, another man, who would, who would you know, mock the things of God who would despise the things of the Bible, who would teach and practice things contrary to the Word of God. It's the rich that do that. Because they cannot, they know that despite all their billions, despite all the money that they have, they cannot attain the wisdom of God because God is the source of true wisdom. You see, only God can impart true wisdom. As it says there in verse 23, God understandeth the way thereof, and He knoweth the place thereof. God knows where wisdom is. God understands where it is. He knows where it's to be found. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth unto the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds and he weigheth the waters by measure when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Then did he see it and declare it. And he prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You see, in this chapter of Job 28, God shows us the true value of wisdom. And there he asks the question, where shall wisdom be found? Where shall wisdom be found? That's the title of the sermon this morning. Where shall wisdom be found? We've seen how valuable it is. We've seen how rare it is. So then the question is, well, where shall wisdom be found? Where can we find it? That's the question we ought to ask. And I love when God asks this question in His Word. Where shall wisdom be found? Because it's not a rhetorical question. It's not a question that he asks for a dramatic effect. It's not something he just puts out there to try and prove a point. No, he answers the question. He asks us. He shows us the value. And then he asks us the question, Lord, where are you going to find it? Now that you see how valuable wisdom is, where will you find it? And we will see the answer. As it says there in verse 28, it says, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And apart from evil is understanding. So we see, first of all, that wisdom, if we want wisdom in our lives, if we want to attain wisdom, if we want that which is more valuable than anything else that can be found in the earth, we would desire wisdom. And that wisdom is found in the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now that phrase right there, the beginning of wisdom, is the fear of the Lord. That phrase alone can warn an entire sermon. It's used multiple times throughout the scriptures. And it shows us the results of the fear of the Lord. I'll just touch on it this morning, but it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does it mean that it's the beginning of wisdom? Meaning it's the basics, it's the fundamentals. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end of wisdom, it's the very beginning of it. See, if we ever hope to be wise, we need to start with the fact that God is one who is to be feared. And there's this misunderstanding out there today what, what fear is. And I've heard people say this, that fear is just this godly reverence. But it says, come before the Lord with fear and trembling. Explain to me how the Apostle uh, John, when he saw the glorified Christ in the book of Revelation, he didn't just you know, say, I, I stood and saluted the Lord with great respect and reverence. No, the Bible says he fell down and fell, he fell down on his face as one dead. And that God had to cut to him and say, fear not, and stand him upon his feet. And many times we see that in the scripture where one encounters God, the Lord of hosts, as Joshua did when he was about to cross into the, into the promised land, the river Jordan, and he saw the captain of the, of the, of the Lord's host. On the other side, with the sword drawn, the Bible says he fell on his face as one, you know, in worship and out of fear, not just as God, not just as reverence and respect. You know, that's something that you know children show their parents is respect and honor, right? But I guarantee you that to some degree, there is an element of fear involved. Trust me, I know. 
We see that wisdom, if we want it, it begins with the fear of the Lord. God is not going to give wisdom to those who don't have even enough sense to fear Him. And how hard could that really be? When we begin to understand who God is and we read the Word of God and start to see the, the, the nature and character of God, that God is a righteous and holy God, one who will punish iniquity. I mean, the Bible says that, that, that God is the one who kindled fire, the fires of hell. The Bible says that God is even present there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, lo, thou art there. The Bible says that those that go to hell will be tormented in the presence of the Lord and of his angels. And they have no rest day or night. And we see it is God that has not only created hell for the devil and his angels, but it is also God that sends up the people to hell. God is a God that is to be feared. And if we want to understand and have the knowledge and wisdom of God, we need to understand that we must fear God. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it says this, But fools despise wisdom and instruction. As we saw earlier, it's the rich. They're the ones that fall into foolish lusts and hurtful lusts. The rich are the ones that despise wisdom and understanding because it cannot be bought with gold. You see, the fear of the Lord is essential for wisdom. It's something we must have. God is not going to give it to those that despise Him. And who is it? Who is the biggest fool of them all? It's the, isn't it the one who just denies the very existence of God? Isn't it the one who says there is no God? The Bible says in Psalm 14, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. It, obviously, this isn't a guy who fears God. If he denies the very existence of Him, that he would, he would say that he is the one that is the biggest fool of all. And really, as I said, this, I, this concept, this idea of, of fearing the Lord, it deserves an entire sermon. But we're going to move on because the question we're asking ourselves this morning is where is wisdom to be found? We've seen the value of it. We've seen that God puts great value on wisdom. And it's God that knows where wisdom is to be found. And it's God that can give the wisdom that we need in our life. And we need that wisdom. We need wisdom in every aspect of our life. We need wisdom in our marriages. We need wisdom in raising our children. We need wisdom in, in, in how to perform our, our daily tasks at work and how to raise a family and how to just conduct ourselves and to have a good and upright conversation in the world. We need to have the wisdom of God. And in order to have that, we must have the fear of God. The question this morning we're asking is, where is wisdom? Where is, shall wisdom be found? We see that wisdom is found in the fear of, old, fear of the Lord but also. Number two, wisdom is found in the Word of God. That's a great place to find wisdom. In fact, that's where we're going to find the wisdom of God, is, is yes, in fearing God. And God, as we fear God and, and, and serve God and love God and read His Word, He'll begin to give us the wisdom out of the Word of God. It's not that we fear God and, and then when we go to bed at night, God's going to come down like some kind of tooth fairy and put wisdom behind our ear or under our pillow and we're going to wake up. I mean, you've been very good. You feared me. He's not some kind of spiritual Santa Claus that if we behave ourselves, that, that you know, God, if we're going to go out one morning and find wisdom wrapped up in a nice little package. Wisdom is, is, a, is a, something that's given spiritually. It's something that's given uh, to us, you know, supernaturally even. You could say it's something that, but it's something that we find in the reading of the Word of God. And when we begin to delight ourselves in the things of God, and God will begin to open up His Word and allow us to behold wondrous things out of His law. You see, the, right, the reading of the Word of God is what will make us wise. The Bible truly does have the answer for every problem of life. There is no, there is no, nothing, no, no conflict or, or difficulty or problem that we can encounter in life that the Bible does not address and give a solution for. The Bible says, and if you would turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. While you're turning to Proverbs 22, I'll read to you from 2 Timothy. The Bible says, continue, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul here is reminding Timothy that it is the holy scriptures that are able to make the one wise. We see then that wisdom is found in the reading of the word of God. Here in Proverbs 22, look at verse 17. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 17, Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou wilt keep them with thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made thee known to know this day, even to thee. Have not I written unto thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth? 
So if we're going to hear the words of the wise, if we're going to have wisdom, we're going to listen to the writings of the Bible. The words of the wise are found in the things that are written in, ex, uh, written in, in things of counsel and knowledge. They're written in the words of truth. You see, we find wisdom in the fear of the Lord this morning. Where is wisdom found? It's found in the fear of the Lord. Where is wisdom? Where shall we find wisdom? Where shall it be found? It'll be found in the reading of the Word of God. It'll be also be found in meditating upon the words of God that will make us wise. The Bible says in Psalm 119, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Thou, thou through my, thy commandments had made me wiser than mine enemies. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. So we see that meditating upon the word of God, that not only just reading it, but dwelling on it, thinking about the things that we have read, trying to, to, to understand uh, the deeper meanings of the things that we, we've read, and the memorization and the meditating of the word of God, those are the things that are going to make us wiser than our enemies. Those are the things that are going to make, have us, give us more understanding than any of our teachers. Those are the things that are going to help us to understand more than the ancients. When we read the Word of God, but then we don't just close the Bible and don't think about it for another 24 hours. No, we read about it, and then we begin to dwell on it. We think about it. We recall things. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that happens to me at work. Just the simplest tasks of, you know, of keeping a right attitude at work and having you know, the, the verses that can come to mind of telling us, you know, well, we ought, what kind of employees we ought to be. And children, they, all, they also probably should have that, these kind of things come to mind. It would be helpful for a child throughout the day. Yes, they've heard it said, you know, children, obey your parents. But does that come to mind? Do you meditate upon that throughout the day? When you're, when you're at home with your mother and she's asking you to do something, does that verse come to mind? Do you meditate upon it? Are you, are you mindful to keep a correct attitude of understanding that the Word of God commands you to obey your parents? You see, the Bible showing us here that if we want to know where wisdom is to be found, we must understand it is found in the reading of the Word of God. It is found in the meditating, uh, meditating upon the Word of God. So if we see that reading and meditating upon the Word of God is what gives us wisdom, then let me ask you the question, why don't we see more wise people? I mean, is the, is the King James Bible hard to find today, especially in 2017 America? It's in, it's in every dollar store, practically, that I, I would assume. It's easy to find. You could go to a church and get one for free. If you come to Faithful Word, we could find the King James Bible. Many people have the Bible just sitting on their shelf and they never crack it open. That's why we don't see more wise people. If people would actually open the Bible and read it and understand it and meditate upon it, people would become wise. You see, wisdom this morning, where shall wisdom be found? It's not buried thousands of feet below the earth somewhere under tons and tons of rock. No, the Bible says is showing us that, that, the, that the wisdom is accessible. The only reason that it's rare, rare is because it's not sought after. We don't see a lot of wise people because they don't bother to read. They don't bother to meditate. And why is that? Why is it that though the Bible is there to give us wisdom, though the Bible is there to give us knowledge and understanding, though it's, it's easily accessible today, why is it that it's still so much more rare than even, why is the wisdom of God so much more rare than even the precious things of the earth? It's because being wise, reading, it takes work. It still takes effort. It takes, you know, time and energy has to be put forth. Just as a man has to pick up a pick and shovel and a cart and go into a mountain and spend hours and you know, years digging and digging and searching in hopes of finding some kind of, you know, precious stone, gold and silver. Even so, a man, if we hope to be wise, we must open and mine the Word of God. We must be found in it daily going through it, sifting through the pages of the Word of God and letting Him show us these jewels, these, these, these veins of wisdom and understanding. Proverbs 26, if you would turn over to Proverbs 26. The reason we don't see many wise people today is because they do not want to take the time to work at reading the Word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, verse 16, The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. You see, it's the sluggard who's wiser in his own conceit. That's what we see today. A lot of people, who they're, they're conceited, they think they know everything, and they're sluggards, when it, especially when it comes to the reading of the Word of God. Professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools. They have denied God. They've turned Him 
in the, 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 the creator into a creature. And we see that it is, that it is the sluggard, that he who is wise in his own conceit, the one man who is too lazy to open up the Bible and read. That's why we see so many foolish people, because wisdom takes work. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You see, the Bible showing us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 that weariness of study is a fact of life. That if we're going to be wise, if we're going to endeavor to understand the words of God, and especially those that would endeavor to teach and preach the word of God, even those that would desire to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that would take it, would desire to take the Bible and open their mouths boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel in soul winning and going door to door and confronting others about the condition of their soul, even those will have to take the time to study and understand and know the Word of God. And that's a weariness of the flesh, as it says there. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's a fact that if you're going to want to know the Word of God, if you want to be made wise by the Word of God, that you are going to experience weariness because weariness and study is a fact. It will happen. But that's not an excuse. Just because it's a fact does not, is not an excuse. It says there, in verse 13, keep His commandments. It says if we keep, fear God and keep His commandments. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. He didn't say, you know, much theory, weariness is a study of the flesh. Therefore, do as much as you can can. You know, it's okay if you don't get everything you should. It's okay if you let some things slip. No, he says, he still says at the end there, keep His commandments. And how are you going to keep His commandments if you don't know what those commandments are? To understand to be able to keep God's commandments, you have to understand what God's commandments are. And therefore, you're still going to have to study. And you're going to have to experience the weariness of the flesh. The Bible, there's going to be days where you don't want to read your Bible. There's going to be days where you're going to understand, why do I have to read nine chapters of, of chronologies? Why, why do I have to go through all these names? But there's jewels in there. There's gems. There's things that if we understood and studied out, we would see great things out of the Word of God. You see, mining the metals of Job 28, it takes great effort. You know, we see these men, you know, going after the vein of silver. We see the men going after the dust of gold. We see the men going after the topaz of Ethiopia and the, and the fine gold and the pure gold and, and all these precious jewels that are in the earth. And it's, it is accomplished by those men through desire. It's not because it's easy. It's not because it's all sitting there right on the surface and all they have to do is walk by and pick it up. No, they have to dig these huge pits. They have to tunnel under the earth thousands of feet. They have to put their lives in peril. They have to endanger themselves searching for these things. But they still do it, don't they? It's because they desire those minerals. And the same goes for wisdom, doesn't it? It says through desire, in Proverbs 18, if you're there, turn to Proverbs 18. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So it's through desire. It's not because it's easy. It's because that's what we want to do. That's why these men, you know, go and, and dig in the earth after all these gold, after all this gold and precious substance, because that's what they want. So the question is, where shall wisdom be found? Well, maybe another question we ought to ask ourselves this morning: Do you really want to be wise? Because maybe we don't like the answer thus far. Maybe you're hoping, you know, we could just download wisdom like some kind of app on our phone. Maybe we're, you know, today in this society, in this culture that we live in, in this world where everything's just on demand all the time, you know? We can have it in an instant. we got drive-through, right? We don't want to wait more than a few minutes for our food anymore. We're, we, we're inconvenienced if the Wi-Fi goes out. You know, it's, it's a tragedy these days. But the Bible says that if we want to be wise, it's gonna be, we're going to experience weariness of the flesh, we're going to have to study the Word of God, and where it's only going to be accomplished through desire. Do you want to be wise this morning? Bible asks, where is wisdom? God's showing us where it's found. So the next question we need to ask is, do you want to be wise? Through desire, a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You see, we do what we want in spite of difficulty. We do what we want. For example, a man, if he's right with God, desires to take care of his family. You know, he wants to, he wants to feed his family. You know, if you're trying to live it by a biblical model in your home, you know, you want your wife to stay home, as the Bible says that the, the, the woman should be keepers at home. 
and the man is the one who should go out and work by the sweat of his brow that he can provide for his own. So if we want to do that, if that's our desire to be right with God in that area, you know, then obviously what we need to do is go out and find the easiest job we can, right? Where we work the le the le as, least, as little as we can, and we get as paid as much as we can, right? Is that what we look for? No. If that's our desire, if our desire is to provide for a family, we don't care what the job is. We don't care how many hours we're going to have to work. We're going to go do it in spite of the difficulty. See, you do what you want. That's, what, that's the whole point of this, of this verse here, that through desire, a man having separated himself seeketh an inner metal with all wisdom. You see, we do what we desire in spite of difficulty. You do what you want. Do you want to be wise? Then you're going to be prepared to endure the difficulty. And we think about people endure great difficulty and, and trials and tribulations to accomplish things that are far less meaningful than, than biblical wisdom. They, 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 they labor in, in things that, that, uh, that don't profit in, in, in eternity. You think of these great sporting events that, and the men that, you know, that, that pro, pro, these professional athletes that just go through the training camps and, the, and the, the regiments and the physical exercise and the dietary restrictions and all these things that they put their bodies through so they can get a Super Bowl ring, so they can get some gold rings, so they can hold a trophy for, for, and have some fleeting moment of vain glory for man. But do we desire to have the wisdom of God? That, that the Bible says that, that God has said that is far more precious than any, any substance on the earth, that you could, even if you were to mine every ounce of gold out of the earth and pile it, that you could not give that in exchange for the wisdom of God? Because of wisdom, if we remember, it's the scriptures that make us wise unto salvation. What shall a man give you know, in exchange for his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And I want to conclude my last point by, by saying this. If we desire wi wisdom in the Word of God, we will mine for it. We will. We'll, we'll get in the Word of God and we'll start digging. And we'll start, we'll get out that, you know, pickaxe of prayer and we'll start chipping away. We'll get the, the ore cart out and we'll start hauling out the things of God. We'll get the rock crusher. We'll, we'll start crushing those rocks. We'll start doing those word studies. We'll start, you know, writing down things and taking those notes. We'll start to mine the Word of God for the wisdom that's in it. Proverbs chapter 2, if you would, turn to Proverbs chapter 2. You see, if we desire wisdom from the Word of God, we will mine for it. Just as those men who desire gold, you know, I was watching this documentary last night after I wrote this, because I like mining. It's more, I think it's fascinating. I think it's really interesting. I think it's an interesting industry. Um, and it's interesting work to me. And then there's this mine in South Africa. I mean, this will just show you the great lengths that man is willing to go for for something as, as like gold. They have literally gone down over 2,000 feet. It is the lowest point man has ever been. It's 2,000 feet below the sur surface of the earth. It's deeper than the Grand Canyon. Now, I've never been to Grand Canyon, but they tell me it's pretty deep. Right? If you were to fall off the face of the Grand, or off the cliff of the Grand Canyon, you're not going to make it. And they've dug this hole, and they have this elevator that travels at 40 miles an hour. It goes down. And they take 350 men down there every day. They have three shifts of 350 men. And they're, and they're digging and they're blasting their way 2,000 feet below the surface of the earth towards this vein where they, they, they believe there's this vein of gold. And it's there, they're beginning to find it. And then they're hauling it all out through this just laborious process, blasting. And they have these earthquakes down there, these seismic shifts. They say that happens dozens of times a day. You're down there 2,000 feet. You have tons and tons and tons of, of the earth's material above your head. And, and, and the rocks are shifting. I mean, they have to blast and they have to drive these rods and hold, try to hold the ceiling up so they can continue to they, you know, drill more holes in the face of the rock and, and put in this explosive. And they said that when they, whenever they blast, they go 12 to 18 feet. 12 to 18 feet. 12 to 18 feet. And they're trying and they're going down these, these caverns and, and, and making these caverns below the earth in the hopes of finding this gold. And what was, I thought was really interesting is that they're so far down there that when they when they get to the face rock, the face blast or the, where the at the face of the tunnel where it's you know where it's ended, that that rock just from the geological forces that are there, are, are, are it measures if you were to touch that rock it's 120 degrees just just by being there just by from all the stress of the earth uh, and the pressure compounding on it that it's it's hot it's dangerous it's sweaty it's difficult work but they desire that gold because there's billions of dollars of worth of gold and they're going to blast until they find it. And people die in mines and, and, and mining is an extremely dangerous uh, job and has been in, throughout its existence. But it just shows you that if a man desires something bad enough, he's willing to go to great lengths. 
And the question, you know, is where is wisdom to be found? But the other question we need to ask is, do we really want to be wise? Do we desire biblical wisdom? Do we desire to be wise in our lives? That we can, we can live a life that's honoring and pleasing to God? Well, if we do, then we have to be willing to go to great lengths in the Word of God, reading and studying and, and experiencing even that weariness of the flesh. We need to be disciplined and have the character to read the Bible. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. You see, the true riches in this world, they're never on the surface. They're never right there, easily accessible. And unless, you know, of course, others have brought them here. You know, we can glean a certain degree of wisdom from the preaching of the Word of God. We can go to church two, three times a week, and hear the man of God get up, and give us some nugget, some kernel. You know, we can go down to the jewelry store today and buy a few ounces of gold in the form of a ring or an earring or a bracelet or a necklace. But we're never going to get those big nuggets. We're never going to get those, you know, just huge, heavy bricks of wisdom and gold unless we're the ones who are going to actually do the mining. We can find the stuff down at the store. We can go to the preaching and get a little bit of wisdom. And we can glean from it. And there are certain things that we, and we ought to. We ought to be trying to get every, every, you know, sliver of wisdom we can find. But they're ne true riches, the true wisdom. It's never found right there on the surface unless others have brought them there. You see, the preacher can only give you so much at a time. You can only afford so much of your time to give to the, to the, to the, the preaching the Word of God. You know, no one's going to go down to the jewelry store and, and, get, and take all the money they have and buy every bit of gold and silver that they have in that place. And it's the same way with wisdom. You know, we can't spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week and expecting the man of God to get up and teach us everything out of the Word of God. We must dig for ourselves. We need the mining tools of reading and study. We need to get those things and we need to start mining in the Word of God. You see, some people, they dig for earthly treasures and they never find them. Don't we ever, do we see, or they, or they find them and they, and they exhaust all of them in there. You know, when we come from Michigan, you know, there was a great deal of copper that was taken out of the Upper Peninsula. And those, there's just abandoned mines everywhere. Even here in Arizona, you can go to these ghost mining towns that are just completely abandoned. And you can find these old mines where, where men have dug down and they have found them and they have taken everything there is. And some people will dig for those earthly treasures and they'll never find them. There's this thing called gold fever that people get. And it, and it has wasted the time and, and money of many people that get it. They get this bug. And I've personally known people that if I, you know what, I'm going to go up to these old abandoned mines, and we're going to start breaking up these rocks, and they go on and they buy all this equipment, and they go up there and they spend days, they travel to these distant mines, and they try to go through this process. But I'm telling you, if there were any, if there was any gold in the, and then the dark hills there, you know, if you was really sitting on a gold mine, it already been dug, it, it already been done, dug up. You know, someone's already been there. Someone's already dug all the all the wealth out of it. There's nothing you find, but people will waste their entire lives and all their substance chasing after gold fever. It's a bug. And that'd be a real shame for us to go through our entire life and never have real wisdom. Never have the understanding and the knowledge and the wisdom of God simply because we didn't know where to look or simply because we were too lazy to do it or we thought it would be something that would be easily found. You see, God's riches are sure to be found. The Bible says in, in Job 28, verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom... He giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. It's not that God doesn't have it. It's not that God doesn't want to give it. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. I'm sorry, this is Proverbs chapter 2. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgments and preserveth the way of his saints. The Bible says in verse 9, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity in every good path. You see, it's not that wisdom is hard to find. That's not why it's rare today. It's just because so few people have it. And if we want the wisdom of God, it's at our fingertips. The knowledge and understanding of God is, are right here within these pages. But it's up to us to start mining the things, the Word of God, out of it. Yes, we'll have, we will have you know, weariness of the flesh. Yes, it will require discipline. Yes, it will require 
uh, duty and, and, and having to put ourselves perhaps at the weird, you know, there'll be the times where, where we don't want to read, but we have to do it anyway. We should never completely stop. We should be in it as, every day as much as we can. And that's where we're going to find the true wisdom. That's where we're going to find the true riches of God are in His Word. So where is wisdom to be found today? That's the, that's the title of the sermon. Where shall wisdom be found? It's right here. And it's of great value. It's more precious than anything on the face of this earth. And we have it at our fingertips. So my challenge is, let's be found in it. Let's be found in the Word of God. Let's be wise people. Let's know our God. And let's do exploits for Him. And let's pray in Jesus. Heavenly Father, again, thank You that You would... Uh, and we thank You that You have given us Your Word. And Lord, we thank You that Lord, we can open it every day. That We, you know, we live in a country where, where Bibles abound, Lord. We, where many of us have multiple copies of the Word of God just lying about. We, we, we wear out one book and, and we, we purchase another. Or that we even have many options, Lord, to, to buy very to nice Bibles. Lord, we can, we can buy you know, different types of skins on our Bibles, Lord, different fonts and sizes. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take advantage of that opportunity that we have to, to, to read the Word of God. Because truly, Lord, that is where wisdom will be found. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, throughout this, this coming week, that as we read the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, that you would make us wiser for it. That you would show us, Lord, the great gems of your Word, the great um, veins of wisdom and truth, Lord, that we can mine out and, and make a part of our life, Lord, that we can adorn ourselves with godliness. And Father, I just pray that you would uh, bless now as we go our own way and keep us safe and bring us again back uh, next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.